This presentation describes my thoughts on the nature of X-ray diffraction. During my career, I have never been comfortable with many of the explanations in crystallography. For example, the accepted explanation to remove dynamical effects so that kinematical theory is valid, which is especially relevant to single crystal structure determination. Another example occurs in polycrystalline diffraction. Why is the background so high and why are the peak intensities so reliable even for small numbers of crystals? And do we really understand the variable intensity in the diffraction rings, which is often associated with a range of crystal sizes? Also, the definition of the Lorentz factor suggests that the crystal has to be rotating to estimate the intensity. So what happens with stationary crystals? An alternative explanation is simply the captured region in diffraction space. This is discussed in my 2014 publication and will not be covered here, but is important when we try and understand the measurement of intensity anywhere in diffraction space. I hope that at the end of this presentation you will have a good understanding of the concepts of this new theory, will be convinced by the evidence, have an indication of how we obtain the structure factor and how the background in polycrystalline diffraction might be explained as well as other aspects of X-ray diffraction. Consider this simple drawing showing an instant wave and a scattered wave from a plane of atoms. This is a mirror reflection when both angles are equal. This mirror reflection will apply to each plane of atoms. If the scatter from different planes are an integer number of wavelengths apart, then their amplitudes will add in phase including more instant beam waves from this wavefront, will keep adding to a combined amplitude. As we can see here. And for all possible paths, the amplitudes keep adding in phase. This build-up of the amplitude depends on the plane spacing, the wavelength and the instant angle. This geometrical relationship is Bragg's law and when this condition is met, we call this the Bragg condition. However, remote from the Bragg condition, it is assumed that the amplitude goes to zero through mutual interference. We can simply represent the scattering that we might expect from a perfect crystal, based on the conventional theory. At this instant angle, we would expect no intensity. And again, none. And when the Bragg condition is satisfied, we get a peak. There is some width and fringing associated with the crystal size, similar to a perturbation leading to a smearing of the peak. Moving away, the intensity drops to zero. And again. But actually, we know the intensity doesn't go to zero, but to small values. Let us recap on the Bragg condition. The difference in path length between these two waves is one wavelength, from which we can derive the Bragg equation. Suppose we try and find the condition when the amplitude, and therefore the intensity, is zero. If these waves are half a wavelength apart, then indeed the intensity would be zero. We can represent this with a similar equation to Bragg's equation. That is not the only condition. In this case, the waves create a null point at one and a half wavelengths. As a side note here, the wave trains are not infinitely long, but about 25,000 wavelengths for a typical laboratory source. So at large beam separations, the coherence is lost and there is no interference. That is, we have gone beyond the coherence length. So we can place the Bragg condition angle and where the intensities go to zero on a diagram like this. Clearly the intensity does not have a simple maximum and zero intensities, so we need to calculate the intensity between these angles, 
which can be achieved by considering a stack of planes. Consider the mirror reflection from this first plane, which we will call A1. The second plane will have a mirror amplitude of A2, which is the same as that from the first plane. However, they are not in phase, unless the path difference is equal to one wavelength. So we call this general phase difference phi. We can then just keep adding planes to give a sum of amplitudes until we have reached the bottom of the crystal, which is composed of n planes. With a bit of manipulation shown in the grey box, we can sum all these amplitude contributions to give the circled function. The intensity, when ignoring absorption and subsequent scattering events, will be simply the square of the amplitude. The phase of the wave, compared to the layer above, is derived from the path difference, which is simply the misalignment of the two waves. From simple geometry, we can calculate the path difference based on the plane spacing d and the instant angle theta. The path difference, shown as dark black lines in the diagram, is simply 2d sine theta. As we showed earlier, the contributing waves are in phase when they correspond to an integer number of wavelengths, which is equivalent to waves being offset by an integer number of 360 degrees or 2 pi. So the phase value, phi, for our amplitude equation is given in the yellow box. The intensity goes to a maximum when the phase difference goes to zero and n can take on any integer value. If we plot the intensity function on our previous diagram for the two-layer system, we get the blue line. We can see that the amplitude goes to a maximum at the Bragg condition and to zero where we expected. What happens if we introduce a third layer? We can immediately see that this third contribution is one wavelength separation with respect to the first layer. This results in an amplitude associated with a single layer system at the angle which was zero for the last two layer calculation. Using the same formula, but now with n equals three, we can see that the profile has more zero points and the amplitude at the Bragg condition is now the square of 3a and the smaller peak is at a squared. We can keep adding layers, for example for a four layer system, we'll give a zero point at the same angle as a two layer system. And we can now see that the peak intensity increases and the fringing becomes more complex. This can be extended to a crystal including 10,000 planes. So for example, a unit cell of 10 Anstrongs, this would correspond to a 10 micron size crystal, if this is a first order reflection. The complexity is increasing and the intensity is weak away from the Bragg peak, but it is still there. Until now, we have concentrated on the symmetrical mirror reflection. So what happens if we look for intensity away from this condition? Where are the zeros and where are the peaks? We can follow the same arguments as before. We know that the waves from these two layers must have a path difference a plus b equal to half of wavelengths to have zero intensity. What we want to find is the combination of the instant angle omega and observation point 2 theta where this is satisfied. We can include any combination of P with a point Q on the plane below. If P combines with all possible positions of Q, then we have the symmetrical condition as discussed earlier. What we are interested in here is, are all the zero positions randomly distributed or everywhere as suggested by Bragg, or are they concentrated at specific angles? We can now derive the length A plus B by geometry. We can see that alpha gives the angular offset of the point Q with respect to P such that the length PQ is D over cos alpha 
and from this we can obtain expressions for a and b. The next stage is to determine the number of alpha values for which we use a small increment that give a plus b close to half and one and a half wavelengths. The numbers of alpha values for a matrix of omega and 2 theta are plotted here. They are concentrated at specific values of 2 theta regardless of the instant angle omega. We can repeat this for another separation of crystal planes. These calculations are quite sensitive to the input parameters. The next stage is to calculate the intensity at a 2 theta position for some arbitrary instant angle. We can refer back to our diagram of the mirror or specular condition. A combination of a second point increases the amplitude and hence intensity. That is, there's no path length difference and so the amplitudes simply add. But suppose we move our observation point 2 theta so that the path difference is not necessarily one wavelength or half a wavelength, but somewhere in between. We therefore have a weak amplitude at this point. As we include more and more weak amplitudes, the resultant increases in magnitude, as shown here. This is extended across the width of the crystal plane, until eventually, for our full-size crystal, we obtain this relationship, which represents the summation of all these amplitudes and phases. So we can see the intensity exists over all angles, and comes to a maximum when the true specular or mirror condition is achieved, and now it falls away. Since there is intensity at angles away from the specular, we should see how the intensity is distributed in 2 theta, and see if these contributions are in phase from layer to layer. That is, their path length corresponds to an inch to number of wavelengths. So adding the contributions, we get, by adding more and more planes, this scattered intensity might be significant. And so it builds, but where? We can go through the same analysis as before, but now we are looking for combinations of omega and 2 theta that give rise to path lengths a plus b equal to one wavelength. The equations and procedure are the same as before, but in this case we obtain the sum of alpha values that give a plus b equal to one wavelength. What we find is that there is enhancement of the intensity at twice the Bragg angle regardless of the instant angle. This is just a repeat for a higher order reflection. The width in 2 theta narrows as the path length gets closer to one wavelength, which is relevant to crystals with many planes. So to calculate the intensity at any instant angle and 2 theta, we can take our earlier derivation for the amplitude from each plane. That can be combined with all the other planes by including our second expression. Thus we have two possible maxima, one associated with the specular or mirror reflection, and the other due to the combination of all the planes, which we now know is concentrated at 2 theta b, that is, at twice the Bragg angle. So we can draw a similar schematic as before, but with a new theory where there are two peaks. The intensity of both peaks increase and come to a maxima at the Bragg condition when they combine and give strong intensity. You will note that the intensity of the mirror, the moving peak, is stronger than the enhancement peak at 2 theta b, and both diminish moving away from the Bragg condition. We see this effect in a carefully designed experiment. In this case, we see the specular peak and the enhancement peaks. The data is collected on a stationary position sensitive detector for various fixed instant angles. The enhancement peak 
shows the characteristic lines of the source because these depend on d and the relevant wavelength whereas the specular peak will reflect all wavelengths simultaneously. The schematic is not on the same scale as the experimental angles. As we move closer to the Bragg condition, the peaks begin to interact, and the intensity of both increases. Until, at the Bragg condition, for the copper K-alpha-1 wavelength, the intensity becomes very strong for this perfect crystal. At this position, close to, but not at the alpha-2 peak, the specular peak enhances the alpha-2 peak more than the alpha-1 peak. As we rotate away, the copper K-alpha doublet begins to look more recognisable. At this large rotation, the two peaks are in their predicted positions. I now want to show you the results of another calculation obtained by summing the amplitudes from a square array of point scatterers. The red arrow is the expected position for the specular peak and the blue arrow is that for the enhancement peak. The two peaks are seen and associated with the mirror and enhancement angles. We might think that the shape has a big effect and the specular peak is just some form of crystal truncation rod. However, from the second example, where the square is fixed and the crystal planes are rotated, we can see that the mirror or specular peak is associated with the crystal planes and not dominated by the crystal shape. The enhancement peak is related to their separation and this is clearly a pure diffraction effect and not unique to X-rays. So far, we have just concentrated on the concept and the description in the plane containing a crystal plane normal, whereas the scattering goes everywhere. This is because each scattering point produces a spherical wavefront, so it is not confined to a single plane. In the new theory, the equation was given for determining the intensity at any position in space. As can be seen in this simulation of point scatterers, the specular scattering has a locus that touches the direct beam and what we called the specular peak in the principal scattering plane at 2 omega. This peak is broad because of the crystal size, whereas the enhancement peak at 2 theta b is sharp. If we run a video of this, we can see that the enhancement peak is always present as the specular peak moves. This isolation of a single plane is achieved by making the point scatterers in the plane less than a wavelength apart. If this is relaxed creating a larger set of planes then the complexity of the pattern increases but the same principles apply. So the next question is does this point scattering model which is a lengthy calculation give the same result as the expression derived earlier? Well, fortunately yes, within the accuracy of the simulation. The derived expression, given below, is represented as the blue curve. Now with typical crystals, we don't see two peaks. So what is going on? We should look at the scattering in more detail and consider what happens at the point of scatter. The scattered wave has a phase lag of 90 degrees at the Bragg condition. We can see, as far as our description is concerned, it makes no difference. However, if the scattered wave is at the correct angle for the Bragg condition, then it will re-scatter from the underside of the planes above. The scattered wave is suppressed as the intensity is shared. But, as we can see with this double reflected wave, it has a phase lag of 180 degrees with respect to the instant wave and is therefore completely out of phase with it, thus weakening the instant wave. This has a knock-on effect throughout the crystal and results in a very different intensity than we might expect from kinematical theory. Take for example a 3 micron lanthanum hexaboride crystal. 
This simulation shows that the kinematical and dynamical intensities are very different. A factor of 6 in height and 2.2 in the in integrated intensity. So deriving the structure factor is not simply the square root of the measured intensity. Since conventional theory relies on the Bragg condition and typical structure determinations assume that the structure factor is the square root of the measured intensity, a problem arises. We know that dynamical and kinematical theory start to coincide for very small crystals, so it is generally assumed that crystals are imperfect and fragmented into small blocks that scatter incoherently with respect to each other. But are crystals really like this? We know that dynamical and kinematical theories come together in small crystals, so how small do these blocks have to be? This must vary with different structures. Also, how do the blocks fit together? The peak width should then be characteristic of the block size. Is this description realistic? With the new theory, we can consider our crystal as having some crystal plane curvature. This is not unexpected, as defects, however small, will create this. Then our instant beam will form a range of specular peaks depending on the inclination of the planes. This results in a broad, weak peak. However, every scattering point will put intensity at 2 theta b, and their concentration will be additive. Only those mirror reflections that coincide with the Bragg angle will satisfy the Bragg condition, and the dynamical effects occur. Therefore, the proportion of the total scattering that is dynamical becomes very small in imperfect crystals. Is this a reasonable explanation? If we take a less perfect crystal and repeat the experiment given earlier, although in this case the X-ray source is monochromatic, the first thing to note is that the specular peak is broad and weaker than the enhancement peak. This is on a square root scale as with the perfect crystal experiment shown earlier. As the peaks begin to overlap, the intensities increase, until the overlap is maximised to give high intensity. The specular peak weakens, and so does the enhancement peak. The diffraction peak is clearly present when the instant angle is remote from the Bragg condition. This experiment is consistent with the explanation based on the new theory. So, if we return to our array of point scatterers, but this time they are arranged on the undulating planes, what we find is that the mirror or specular reflection has disappeared, but the enhancement peak remains. The additional peaks are a consequence of the periodicities associated with the undulations. We can now start to understand a polycrystalline diffraction pattern. Suppose the crystals are not perfect, then for a crystal in an arbitrary orientation we will have a broad mirror or specular peak and an enhancement peak. If we include another arbitrary orientated crystal, then its specular peak position will be defined by the instant beam angle to the plane, whereas the enhancement peak will add intensity to the same position as the first crystal. There is always a chance that the Bragg condition is satisfied, but this is a rare event. As more crystals are added, the background gradually smooths and fills in and the enhancement peak builds. Eventually the pattern stabilises as more crystal orientations are added. If the crystals are perfect, the pattern requires more crystals to stabilise and in the first instance the background pattern is spiky and the enhancement peak is more variable. We shall use the point scattering simulation to illustrate the build-up of the polycrystalline diffraction pattern assuming the crystal is perfect. This simulation is just one set of layers as before. The first pane gives the plane orientation with the resulting diffraction pattern in the second pane and the instantaneous thin green profile in the fourth pane is the sum of 
of the intensity from the outline sector in pane 2. The Bragg angle is given by the thick red line in pane 2 and 3 and 4 and all crystal orientations that give rise to specular reflections between the thin red lines are excluded. That is, only intensity remote from the Bragg condition is included. The third pane is the accumulated intensity, where we can see the diffraction rings forming. The thick green line in pane 4 is the resulting mean profile. Both the diffraction pattern and the profile clearly resembles those observed in polycrystalline diffraction. You may also have noticed that the second outer ring in pane 3, this is the n equals 2 or harmonic for this set of planes. It is stronger because the contributions close to the specular condition are allowed. This clearly explains much of the background in polycrystalline diffraction and the full set of peaks from a small number of crystals, and also accounts for the reliable patterns of complex structures, and the intensity variation in the diffraction rings from similar sized crystals, which can be simulated with this new theory of X-ray diffraction. Can we explain the variable intensity observed at X-ray free electron lasers? Well, this can be covered by the same description. I have circled a diffraction peak at 2 theta b, which is twice the Bragg angle. We simply obtain snapshots of the intensity from randomly orientated crystals. And for another crystal with another orientation, the Bragg condition is possible, but will be very rare. And another. These enhancement peaks are all part of the scattering from the crystal planes and therefore should be included to determine the structure factor. In more traditional single crystal data collection, this distribution is not captured and the intensity associated with this HKL plane will not be the full intensity. So, should we be concerned about using the conventional theory? Well, yes, I think so. For example, if there is more intensity remote from the Bragg condition, then this must be included or calculated to estimate the structure factor. This shortfall of intensity varies with scattering angle and is not a constant proportion and becomes more pronounced for weak diffraction peaks. Much of this distributed intensity is likely to be below the noise level but that is not a justification for ignoring it. It can be a very significant proportion of the whole. Another consequence is that the intensity might appear at systematically absent positions. For example, the theory predicts intensity from the 111 plane to appear at the 222 diffraction peak position in diamond and silicon. This simply corresponds to a path difference of two wavelengths between adjacent planes. Other areas of impact are in the evaluation of the microstructure especially in interpreting the background for pair distribution or short-range order analysis or the haziness in diffraction rings in polycrystalline diffraction. The former because the background would include broad specular peaks and the latter has a high number of contributions not satisfying Bragg's law. In texture analysis the presence of a peak does not necessarily define the crystal plane orientation. In fact there are many areas of impact and I'm sure that if you are convinced by this explanation, you will be able to extend this list. I would like to acknowledge my colleague John Anderson, who calculated the intensity from point scatterers. And I leave you with a simulation of the scattering from a rotating cube array of point scatterers. You will note that the basic pattern is always there, as in the log plot but the peaks at 2 theta b are enhanced when the specular contributions are close by.
as seen in the linear plot. This is how we should consider X-ray diffraction.